I'm Dom, the BCBA mom, and welcome back to my channel. I'm Dominique, a board certified behavior analyst, well versed in applying ABA to your everyday lives, and I'm a mom more specifically a mother of a child with autism. So if you're here for more practical, positive parenting tips, then you are in the Previous right place. Week, leading up to this episode, we've talked a lot about positive reinforcement. And, posit and as we should, like I mentioned in the past, positive reinforcement is a key foundation in behavior change. And positive reinforcement is used to increase behavior. I'm sure there are a lot of you out there thinking, that's cool and all, but what about those behaviors that we want to see less of? I'm glad you asked because today we are gonna talk about target behaviors for decrease. How do we decrease problematic, severe, or even dangerous behavior. It's healthy to become knowledgeable on both how to increase and how to decrease behavior or how to implement positive reinforcement and punishment because you can't really have one without the other. In behavior analysis, it is a must. It's essential that if we are eliminating or reducing a behavior, we have to then replace it with a more appropriate behavior. This is why. Behavior is a means of communication. When our children, our kiddos, or our loved ones are engaging in behavior, even if it may look like a problematic behavior to us, Mom, that's no. their way of saying, Mom, I need something. I want something. I have to have something. I'm feeling something. So we can't take away their voice. Decreasing a behavior without replacing it with a more appropriate behavior is actually pretty cruel and it's taking away their voice. We want to hear what our kids have to say, but we have to give them the appropriate tools so they can express it in a better way than some of the problem behaviors. Does that make sense? If I need to explain that a little more, please comment below and I'll do a whole episode on behavior replacement and why the benefits of it and what happens when you don't do it. That's not pretty. Would be like telling your son, hey, don't eat with your hands, but you don't provide them with a fork or you don't teach them how to use another utensil. To Guess what? If they're hungry, they're gonna eat. So you can't take away a behavior, the only one they had in their repertoire to eat or to contact that primary reinforcer, you can't take that away without replacing it with something more appropriate. That's how you see effective behavior change. And we're gonna talk about it more in detail right now. Okay. I love this, y'all. Let's start by addressing how do we decrease behavior. In behavior analysis, there are two very effective ways to decrease behavior. One is through punishment. The other is through extinction. Let's talk about punishment. I know, I know. It's not fun. It's not fun to talk about. And you're right, it's exactly how it sounds. But when punishment is implemented the right way, we address the root of the problem or the root of the behavior and we can still have an opportunity to learn a more appropriate behavior. So punishment doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing if you implement it the right way. There are some of us out there, some families, some communities, some neighborhoods, where positive reinforcement is not that easy to contact on a regular basis. Some of us, we live to avoid punishment. I'm not gonna do that so I don't get in trouble. I'm not gonna do that so I don't get arrested. I'm not gonna do that so I don't get kicked but out. We're gonna also talk about ways to make that even more effective. And we're gonna combine a positive reinforcement procedure with it and that's just gonna There are some side effects if you do not implement punishment the right way. One, 
side effect is you could actually reinforce the behavior that you were trying to punish. Let me give you an example. Say your child is calling your name, trying to get your attention. Mom, mom, mommy, 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 mama, mama. And you're busy. You're on the phone, you're cooking dinner. Hey, I get it, mom, we're busy. But this child is still calling our name. Mama, ma, ma. Trying to get our attention and we don't give them, and we don't give that to them. All of a sudden, they throw a tantrum, start screaming and crying, or they pick something up and they throw it at you. And then, I can't believe you did that! Why you doing that? Get out! Why are you crying? Why are you crying? Oh my God, get out! Get out! Guess what? You think you're punishing that behavior, but you just reinforced it. Attention is attention. If that child wanted attention, and they didn't get it by calling your name, in the future, they know if I want attention from mom, all I have to do is fall out, throw a tantrum, or maybe even throw something across the room. That's how I get her attention. All right, let's define punishment. Punishment is the exact same thing as reinforcement, but instead of increasing a behavior, you want to decrease it. So what is punishment? Punishment is immediately adding something to the environment, following the behavior, so the behavior will happen less in the future. Let's say that again. Punishment is very broad, or there are different forms of punishment, and we're gonna go through all of those. And I'm right. gonna show you how they can be to place each punishment to fit the crime. Okay. The punishment should fit the crime. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Okay. We're about to get studious on you just a little bit. All right. The first one is reprimand. Now you shouldn't do this. I told you. You shouldn't be. I'm going to get you. You did this. <laughs> reprimand. For some kiddos, this is enough. They don't like to disappoint their parents. They don't like when their parents are angry with them or if they raise their voice. So verbal reprimand or a little finger wave, sometimes that's what the kid needs to, to punish that behavior and to decrease it. The second one is overcorrection or restitutional overcorrection. Let's say you put a stack of paper on a kid's desk. Like, hey, here's your work. Here you go. I need you to finish this. And the kid is like, I'm not doing it. I know y'all thinking, I wish they would, but it happens. What is the appropriate punishment for that? That would be no overcorrection. This means I want you to pick up every single piece of paper that you dropped and put that back on your desk. When you're done, get started on your work. Thank you. When using this procedure, the child will be responsible okay, for okay. restoring okay. the environment back to okay. its natural okay. state. And then okay. they're responsible okay. for okay. doing the demand that was okay. already okay. set in place. Restitutional overcorrection, which is a little more harsh, okay. is you have to restore the environment okay. and then you have to make it better than it was before as a harsher okay. punishment to never okay. mess up like compliance. that. Again. And that just means physically guiding someone to stop that behavior. Physically, physically blocking it or preventing it from happening. You would use this with more severe behaviors. Behaviors that can danger the child or danger others that are around that child. That's the reason why you would use guide and compliance or any type of physical contact. Another one and one that we are probably all familiar with is timeout. 
I know we all know about timeout, but honestly, a lot of people are using timeout the wrong way. So there are two forms of timeout. There is inclusionary timeout and exclusionary timeout. So timeout just means time away from the reinforcer. You don't necessarily have to sit in a corner by yourself to implement timeout. Also, some people are using timeout the wrong way. If a person is doing that behavior to escape and then you punish it with a timeout, you just gave them what they wanted. Here you go. It's exactly what you wanted. Escape. For example, if a, if a child is in school and he is being disruptive because he knows in about 10 minutes the math test is coming, Hey, I will start making fart noises too. I would do anything to cause a disruption because I know that I'm gonna get sent to the office and I don't have to take the test. Our children are really smart and sometimes they understand these contingencies before we do. These are all really effective punishment procedures to decrease behaviors if and when they are used the right way or if everything that we just talked about so far, those are reactive strategies. That's what you do after the behavior has already occurred. Is it helpful? Is it beneficial? Does it change behavior? Absolutely, it works. But in my personal opinion, if if you want to set your child up for success, meaning that they're not walking around this world looking at ways to just avoid getting in trouble. Oh, no, I can't do that. I'm gonna get in trouble. I can't, I can't. Like, that's no way to live. When you have special needs, there is already so many things that you have to worry about on a daily basis. Parents, it is our job to make these contingencies plain and clear, set our kid up for, or for success, not on the back end, but also on the front end. So right now we are gonna talk about some proactive, some proactive procedures to also help decrease behavior. So first, it's really, really important to understand why your kid is engaging in that behavior. That's really what our job is or as behavior analysts, we want to find out why. If we can find out why, then we can start implementing all the other pieces to the puzzle to either get that behavior to go up or to go down. It's just like a... Mixing, mix, mix, mix. We just mixing it all up, right? All right, let's analyze some real behaviors and come up with some proactive procedures in order to decrease those. So let's say a kid is crying in the car. What I what I would do as a proactive procedure is I would have my kids' favorite books, toys, and snacks already prepared in the car. This is called enriching the environment. If I was hungry and I had my favorite snack in front of me, then I'm less likely to cry. If I was bored and I had my favorite books in front of me, then I'm less likely to cry for boredom because I'm engaged in something that is reinforcing. thing I would do is I would have a car ride playlist on deck. Both of my kids have favorite songs that almost no matter what mood they're in, that song can get them into a place of baseline. I always have my kids' car playlist queued up and ready, just in case somebody want to book. Another proactive procedure, which is probably one of my favorites, is you want to explain the expectations before you get to the activity. So you can tell your child, Hey, Timmy, whoever Timmy is. Hey, Timmy, we are getting ready to go on a long car. On this car ride, I packed your favorite toys. I packed a couple of your favorite books and you have some snacks. This is going to be a long car ride. No yelling in the car. I found myself setting rules 
or expectations almost anywhere we went before we went to the grocery store. So we're going to the grocery store. Please don't ask me if I can buy you anything. Once we're done with groceries, once we get to the aisle, you can choose one thing from the aisle that you can have as a reward for being so appropriate and helping mom in the grocery store. Boom, you just explain the expectations, the behaviors that are expected of you. And once you do this, what you'll have access to after. I literally have to set a rule or an expectation for church or school as for when I let him go to the library by himself. With some kids, you have to say it in a way that they will understand. And you know your child, you know their level of receptive language. Speak to your child in the level that they are able to receive it. You want them to receive it, not leave it. So just to wrap this up, reactive procedures versus proactive procedures. Which one is more effective? From my personal opinion, when you combine opportunities to earn something with opportunities to avoid getting in trouble, it increases the motivation for the child to engage in the behavior you want to see more of and stop doing whatever you want to see less of. So an example of this is if I brought home good grades, I knew that I would get, I don't know, I think my dad was doing like $10 every B and $20 every A, okay? So if I brought home good grades, I would get money for my grades. But if I brought home anything other under a C, I already knew. So on both ends, I was motivated to really focus on my studies, get my work done, and all there that. There are pieces to this puzzle, and we have to piece it together, together, together. Me and you, I'm here for you. I got you, girl. We all need somebody to lean on. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to hit that thumbs up button and subscribe.